Alrighty. Okay, so our next presenter is Connie Poe Cohart. She is a pediatric nurse practitioner in pediatric orthopedics. Connie has worked at university hospitals in orthopedics for over 30 years. She obtained her BSN from Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing and was trained as a pediatric nurse practitioner at Metro Health Medical Center. She's been recognized as the 2001 Rainbow Trustee Award for Excellence and was given the 2001 Clinical Excellence Award. In 2007, she was given the Clinical Excellence Award for nurse practitioners, and that same year, she was awarded the first prize for her poster featuring a retrospective chart review of intrathecal morphine in children with scoliosis. She's a member of and has served many leadership roles in a lot of professional groups across her career. She also has had many speaking engagements and publications across her impressive career. So let's welcome Connie. We're keeping the lights off. We're going to do something different. And are you cold? I know I was freezing back there. I think it's warmer up here. We tried to turn it up, but it's like if you go to the hotel, you can control your heat. Oh no, you can't. <laughs> they have research that shows that, but you know what? They keep trying. They keep trying. So my jacket's in the back corner if you need a jacket. So this is going to be excruciating for me because I'm going to keep the lights up because you know you had lunch, I had lunch, and that's a while, so I, you know. So I get to watch you guys kind of fall asleep. So I'm going to try and entertain you and keep you awake a little bit. And some people say, scoliosis, really? Spinal deformity, I, 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 don't, I don't treat that. Why do I need to know that? Well, I think it's interesting as a nurse, I'm sure a day doesn't go by that either your family member or a patient or someone else says, do you know somebody that? Or I know, my, my niece has scoliosis. What should I do about that? Or, gosh, I have back pain, what should I do? You are the expert of everything, right? I'm orthopedic, so I always tell people, you know, I'm bone. But somehow in my family, I am the expert of Alzheimer's, <laughs> of cardiac, of reflux, of, well, I am the expert of constipation. But, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I get emails and phone calls from a lot of our parents and our patients saying, I know you don't deal with, X, Y, Z, but I bet you know somebody. And so I take this, you know, other people, some people are gonna take different things from this lecture. So take it with a grain of salt. So here we go. Let's talk about scoliosis. So I'm gonna deal with scoliosis, kyphosis, spondylolysis, say that 10 times real fast, spondylolysis, see if you can spell it, and back pain, which is getting worse and worse as far as I'm concerned. So when you look at the spine, here's a quick anatomy lesson. It's supposed to be straight when you look at it from the back. A person with scoliosis has a side-to-side -side curvature of the spine. We can have curves anywhere. You can have them up in the thoracic region. And if you remember from your anatomy way back when, you have seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic, and five lumbar. Remember way back when? And I'm gonna give you a tip of the trade right now because sometimes your patients will bring that up to you. Everyone lean your head forward, reach your hand back to the base of your neck, and as you lean forward, you feel a bump back there. You run your hand down your neck until you feel a bump. That bump's supposed to be there. We get a lot of referrals for that bump. <laughs> so already you're gonna take a pearl away, that bump, and they're gonna love it that you say, you know what? That's your seventh cervical vertebrae. And they're gonna be like, Wow, she's smart. <laughs> They'll listen to you from then on. Now, some people have it bigger than others. Some of us who have a little more weight than others will have a little bigger one, but it's supposed to be there, so it's okay, all right? And those other bumps down the middle of your back, they're also supposed to be there, too. So there's nothing abnormal. So you're, you can have curves in the thoracic spine, which is where the ribs are. You can have curves in the lumbar spine, which is your low back. You can have curves in between, and you can have multiple curves. Now, you don't usually just have one curve. So when you tell a parent you have three curves, their eyes get real big. Oh, my gosh. No, no, no. The body is really smart. It's trying to stand with the head above the tailbone. So you have your balancing curves to make that happen. 
The key is with scoliosis, it's not only a side to side curvature of the spine, you have rotation or twisting of the spine. And anything attached to the spine in that area is also going to twist around. God was very nice to orthopedics, saying he knows that we're a little basic, so we need things that scream at us that we have a problem. So if we have a curve in the thoracic region here, your ribs are attached and they are going to be twisted around. The breath in the front is going to be bigger than the one on the other side, because you literally have the twisting of the spine. You're also going to have a fullness if we have curvature in the lumbar spine. So this is how we're able to pick up scoliosis pretty easily. If we look at a person from the side, they are supposed to have these curves. We have a normal kyphosis in the thoracic region. We have a normal largosis in the neck region and in the low back region. It's when it's increased. We tend to call it kyphosis, but really it's increased kyphosis. So you can see the difference that this is a little sharper. Once again, the body's trying to stand with the head above the tailbone, so most of the time you are also going to have increased lordosis. So why do we treat scoliosis? What's the big deal? Well, we know this curve does not look like a pretty curve, but we are not cosmetics here. We are not plastic surgery. We're not cosmetics. We are concerned more about what are the effects of these curves. If you have very large curves, approximately 70, 80 degrees, we start affecting that heart and lung. And if we also have large curves, we're going to have a functional disability with the bones perhaps causing more back pain too. And if you can imagine, if we had a small child, two, three, four, and the amount of growth potential they have, we're really going to get in trouble with the pulmonary and cardiac with them. So what causes scoliosis? Here's the sad thing. I'm sure you understand idiopathic. Idiopathic means unknown cause, right? My definition is I feel like an idiot. And it's pathetic. So, but unfortunately, scoliosis, 80%, we don't know this cause kill. But we do know that 20% is a genetic disposition. The problem is it's not a clear cut of which chromosome. It's a mixed pattern that goes on. But genetics is involved in so many different things. So out of the other 20%, we do know what, we do know what causes scoliosis. Neuromuscular. Unfortunately, when it rains, it pours. So if you have a child with cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, myelodysplasia, it's like a snowball effect. They don't have the muscle strength to support that spine. If a person has, is a paraplegic, once again, anybody who's a wheelchair bound, they have a more higher incidence of, of obtaining scoliosis because of the muscle imbalance. Leg wind discrepancy. I think about every five to seven years, the news media starts grabbing things when they don't have anything else to talk about, perhaps. But leg end description, if you have one leg shorter than the other, remember, the head wants to stand above the tailbone. I mean, wants to be above the tailbone. So it will literally produce a curve in the spine to get that head above the tailbone. Now, even off your leg length discrepancy, that scoliosis goes away. So that's a different kind of scoliosis we're talking about. And the majority, there's quite a few in the population that do, that do have one leg shorter than the other. Not a problem. Now, congenital, congenital, as you know, means born with. So these kids are born with scoliosis. Because the spine, keep in mind, the spine is formed in the first trimester of pregnancy. Most of the time, the person doesn't even know they're pregnant, perhaps. It's also when the heart and kidney are formed. So if we have a child that has congenital scoliosis, those of you who work in cardiac, keep us in mind, check your child for scoliosis. Or if you're working with kidney, we check for the heart problems. We check for the kidney issues when we see congenital scoliosis. So what does that mean? If we look at an x-ray, you're supposed to have a box-shaped vertebrae. I talk about these are eyeballs. These are really your pedicles, but they look like eyeballs to parents. So each vertebrae should have a box with eyeballs. And we're like building blocks. But um, a person with congenital, you see we have on this one a triangle shape. It doesn't look right. So this x-ray, if we look at this, we're box shaped down here. As we go up, it's like, oh, wait a minute. We're missing a box here, the end of the vertebrae here. As we keep going up, uh-oh, we have what we call a hemivertebrae. We don't have box shape anymore. It's like if you were to stack building blocks on top of each other. 
one box on top of another box, if you put a triangle in there, it skews the area. And on top of each box and on the bottom of each box is your growth plate. So that's where you get your linear growth. So if you have a triangle shape, it's going to grow crooked. If you have a block on one side, it's going to grow crooked. So we can actually see on x-ray that they have a problem with the vertebrae. So once again, though, 80%, you don't see anything abnormal except for a curve on the x-ray. You don't see any problems with the vertebrae themselves. Oh, when we don't know what the cause is, parents figure it out. <laughs> Boy, do they figure it out. He fell down the steps last week. He's left-handed. The backpack did it. Those schools, they have 50 pounds in their backpack. I know that causes scoliosis. It doesn't. But back in the days of Hippocrates, he thought also when you fall in your butt, it produced scoliosis. Well, we all know if we have a back problem, if we have back pain, sometimes you can get some spasm with it. My husband, when his back acts up, oh my God, he's in total spasm with it, and it produces scoliosis. But that's a very temporary thing. It's more from the muscle spasm. Chair backs. One of the reasons why we have chair backs is way back when they thought not having chair backs caused scoliosis. Here's the problem, right? Wrong. But it's kind of nice having those chair backs. Spinning wheels, they also thought that caused kyphosis, but really that's more of a cost of postural kyphosis. So once again, those things are, do not cause it. So let's deal with idiopathic scoliosis. The 80% we don't know what causes it. There's basically three categories based on age. Infantile, which is birth to three years of age. Juvenile, which is four to 10. And just this past year, they now lump these two together and call them early onset scoliosis. So any scoliosis less than 10 years of age is called early onset scoliosis. And then we have our adolescents, which happens to be the most common that most of the people in this room maybe saw or have referred. What's the incidence? Well, it's not rare. One in 20 adolescents have some form of scoliosis. One in 20. So 5% of adolescents have scoliosis. But the thing is, not all of them need treatment. That's the good news. So if we take a group of people, kids that have scoliosis, 5% need treatment. And we consider observation uh, a form of treatment also. So boys equal, boys equal girls of obtaining scoliosis, but girls tend to progress much more often than boys do. There's our genetic disposition, 20%. Your major curve we usually see is the right thoracic curve. It's eight times more often than any other curve that has the right thoracic curve. Thoracic is in what area of the body? Where your ribs are. So you have a higher chance of being able to pick it up very easily when they do the forward bend test. So how do we do this? How do we pick up scoliosis? Well, first of all, well, knowing that kids are all over the place when they're standing, right? You got to get them to stand up straight. So you want to have them stand with their feet together. That's key. Knees straight, arms down to your side, facing forward, and you look at their back. And then the second part of it is you have to put their palms together and have them bend forward. So if we look at this person, we do a head to toe that we can see that their head is centered over the tailbone, the shoulders are level, the waistline is level. Now notice I have a silhouette. Whenever we have new residents in clinic, I can always tell if they have no experience with this because they all feel they have to run their hand down the spine. I'm not sure what that's going to show, that they have bumps, I don't know. Because we're really, we're looking at the silhouette. It will show you the most. So on purpose, I put silhouette slides here. So if we look at a normal person from the side, they have that gentle curves for the kyphosis and lordosis that we should have. And if you also notice, if they're balanced, the ear lines up with the shoulder, which lines up with the hips, which lines up the knees, which lines up with the ankle. Perfect. Now, we bend them forward. This is the forward bending. And the skyline view should be symmetrical. Both lines should be level. We also need to look at the side, at the side view because we want to see if they have kyphosis. We should have a nice, smooth, almost like half circle is what you're looking for. That the lower doses reverses and it's part of this nice, gentle, smooth arc. Now, a person with scoliosis, their head may not be over their tailbone, 
they may have one shoulder higher than the other. Their waistline, they may have an asymmetry here. This is, when you're looking at this, it makes you suspicious whether they have scoliosis or not. How you confirm it is when you bend them forward. Do you see with the asymmetry, this side is higher than the other. It's the ribs being twisted around with that spine that gives you the true signal that they have scoliosis. This is how you have to confirm it with this. If you don't have rotation, most times you do not have scoliosis. So if this is what you're looking at. So you gotta get down and look at the skyline. It's perfect when parents come with their kids, they're sitting in that patient in the chair. I always have the child face their parents. So, so when they forward bend, that parent is at the skyline view and all fun. The kids, don't, the kids do not see their face. That's a cool thing. But the eyes get really big because now they get what everyone's concerned about with the rotation. So a little trick we do. Okay, when we look at kyphosis, a lot of times we'll see that the head is forward from the body. Remember that ear was supposed to be lying back? The shoulders are rolled forward. We have an increased kyphosis here and an increased lordosis. And when they try to bend over, many times their hamstrings will be so tight they can't. And you don't see that nice smooth half circle. You see almost like a mountaintop. It's not, it, it increases their kyphosis when you bend them forward. So what's another way to do this that I found very, very helpful, especially when I was involved with school screening, is we do hands-on, clothes-on. So if your patient comes in, I, I know it sounds weird, but you don't have to put them in a household gown. In fact, a household gown will like distract, distract your eyes where you're supposed to be looking with all the ties and the opening and everything else. So I ask them not to get changed first when I see them, and then later on, I will, if they have something that I can look at their skin to check that I do. But basically, I stand them behind them, and I put my hands on the kid's shoulders. From then on, I'm looking at my hand, and I can see if one hand is higher than the other. It's very visible. It's a very cue, and I can know my hand. Okay, right hand up. And you can feel with your hand. Then I slide my hands underneath the shoulder blades. So I can see, are my thumbs pointing toward each other? Is one hand more prominent that it's out here or is it up here? You can see it much more visible that way by you looking at your own hands. I then slide my hands onto the waist, right above the pelvis, because I want to see, is one hip higher than the other? Do they have a leg length discrepancy by having one hand higher than the other? What's going on? Then I slide my hands forward on their arms and say, put your palms together so I'm guiding them. And I will do a forward bend in a minute. So my slides from now on, knowing if I was to do hands on, you couldn't see what we're looking at. So I had them put bathing suits on. You're going to imagine if you putting your hands on their shoulders, then going underneath the scapulas down on their hips, okay? So first of all, Here's the person. Is your head above her buttocks? Yes or no? Audience participation. Okay, shoulders, are they level? No. Are the scapulas symmetrical? Your hands are underneath. No. Which one's higher? Right one. Okay. So you're saying to yourself, hmm, I think I got one here, huh? Go down to your waistline. Is that waistline symmetrical? No. We can see the space here compared to here. It's going here, hmm, I think we have one, right? I think we have scoliosis. Let's put their palms together and bend them forward. Does this scream to you? It should. This is a surgical candidate. This screams to you. Now, once again, this is why I'm glad the kids are bending forward. They do not see your reaction. The parents are looking at this. Their eyes are really, really big. You're going ding, ding, ding. Now you got to go forward, okay? Let's do some more. Hands on your shoulders. One higher than the other? Yes, no? Right one higher. Now, here's another reason. You see the bra strap helps us here, right? I don't take the bras off. I leave the bras on. There's another clue for you. We got an even going on here. We got a shoulder blade that's off, correct? Right one is higher. Our waistline is not too, too bad. The space here may be a little bit different, but you're suspicious, correct? Bend her forward. Okay, now, this is distracting. Once again, if you had a gown, but we have hair here, but you can see, that side is higher. No problem. Scoliosis, refer. Okay, here's another one. Hand on the shoulders. 
Even or uneven? I tend to say this one's higher. That's my opinion. Shoulder blades. Can you see that your hand would be higher and up? Yeah. yeah. Okay, our waist side, oh my gosh, we got a hip higher there than over here, right? And this one, oh, my residents would be so pleased. They could even see the shadow there. <laughs> you know, I, I do love my residents, don't get me wrong. Bend it forward, bingo. Okay? We got it. Okay, how about this person? Look at her shoulders. Are we good? How's our scapulas? We good? How's our waist line? Oh, I'm pulling a fast one on you, aren't I? So she has scoliosis? No. Now, she could have a little bit of scoliosis because sometimes when you have kyphosis, you can have a little bit of scoliosis. But if we put her on her, turn her to her side, do you see her shoulders are forward? Do you see this is not a gentle slope? And she has increased lordosis too. So what does she have? Kyphosis. And when we bend her forward, do you see this is not a nice, smooth half circle? we have a dive bomb of our kyphosis going on here, okay? Don't laugh at me, Emily. How about with obesity? It's tough. Child obesity is here. So you have a safety net because you, in one way it's bad because you can hide a lot of curve underneath all that adipose. But the other thing is if we have a lot of adipose or a lot of fat, we can't brace them because you can't hang on to their body properly. So you have a little safety net then. But one little trick of the trade is the amount of fat folds are asymmetrical. But you're going to do the same thing. You can find your scapulas here. You can find the waistline, bend them forward. You may have the rotation. You may not. But another trick is to look back. With, if you're by the time I pick up the skin and pick up the T-shirt and take a look at that too. How about kids with disabilities? We know kids with cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, mild dysplasia, kid with a fractured leg comes into your clinic and the parents, you need to screen them, have them sit down. You need to level their pelvis. Then you screen them. So you put sit them on a stool or in a chair, hands on the shoulder, underneath the scapula, go down to their waist. Then you have them separate the legs and they bend forward like they're touching their toes. And you can get down, you get in front, and look to see if they have rotation there. Okay, let's take one at a time. Let's take the green bathing suit woman. Look at her shoulders, look at her scapula, look at her waistline. Are we okay so far? Yeah. Let's look at the girl in the pinky, I call her pinky. Look at her shoulders, look at her scapula, look at her waistline. Is she okay or not? No. Suspicious? Yeah. Okay. Scoliosis, okay? Now here's the other thing. Remember that scoliosis is not only in the thoracic area, it's in the lumbar area, right? You can have it in both areas. So you are behind them, but I also, you, you're behind them looking, but you need to go to the side to look at their kyphosis, but then you need to go to the front. This is a person here, by the way. You, you saw that person, right? You're looking down their low back. So be careful, don't get fooled, because you can have your main curve in that lumbar area and you might miss it. Okay, now that you know how to pick it up, here's the thing that's gonna come to you most often. Well, God, I only saw an elevated shoulder. Don't please, please. It seems like the majority of kids these days have one shoulder higher than the other. Now, I'm gonna blame it on the backpack. <laughs> I'm gonna blame it on the backpack. I'm going to blame it on whatever I want to blame it on, but it's not scoliosis, okay? So you can reassure parents if they have one shoulder in the higher than the other and they don't have any of those other symptoms and when you bend them forward, there was nothing there, they are fine. So tell them to put the backpack on both backpacks, on both shoulders. Tell them to, to play lacrosse with their other arm. I don't know. I don't have the cure for that. So when you examine them, we do a neurological exam, deep tendon reflexes, Here's another cue with deep tendon reflexes. If you have trouble breaking kids of, with their deep tendon reflexes, you can't get them, you know, because kids, they like to be smart. Okay. They either want to go whoosh, or kick it out their leg when you do their knee reflex, or they're like, I'm too cool to do that. <laughs> Hands together like this. Close their eyes. That drives them nuts. You see them peeking. Pull. they got to pull as hard as possible. Then you go after the reflexes. Most kids can't do both at the same time. 
But it's kind of like, what is that, patting your head and rubbing your stomach? It's amazing what they can do. So there's a little tip. Um, muscle strength. Check your muscle strength, upper and lower extremities. Biceps, triceps, so it's push against them, pull against them. I put my shoulders up, don't let me push you down. Fingers extended, don't like, don't want them to squeeze them. They squeeze my fingers, only give them two fingers, because by then they're going to kill those fingers. Two fingers won't hurt you. Muscle strength of the low extremity. Range of motion. See how much they can bend forward. Can they bend to the right? Can they bend to the left? What happens when you hyperextend them? Especially when we're going to be talking about low back pain or spondylolysis or spondylolisthesis. This is when I do want you to take a look at their extremities and their back. Do we have anything unusual going on? Any, you could call it rashes, but it's not a rash. Do we have any hairy patches, literally hair, tufts of hair on their spine? Do we have any sacral dimpling? So you've got to go all the way down the track and tell them to get up close and personal for a moment. Capital lace spots. They're kind of brown colored, irregular. They can be really tiny, really big. They can be on the back. They can be on the extremities. Those are things that are like, I already said God saying, hey, hey, there's something here. Got something, look at me. Okay, those are red flags. Now, Interesting enough, severe pain is usually not associated with scoliosis. To me, kids, you know, people want to give you the right answer, right? So when you say, when they find out they have scoliosis, when they came into your office, they had no problem with their back most of the time. And then all of a sudden you say, do you have pain? Well, because they heard they had scoliosis all of a sudden, they may have pain. So you have to sort it out. Is it because they think we should have pain? Because if I have something wrong with my back, oh my gosh. So we have to sort that out. But nowadays, I'm seeing so much more back pain, and we are seeing so much back pain. Some of it's with scoliosis. It'll be achiness. It's not dis dis uh, uh, disabling. But I'm talking about kids, mind you, okay? Adults is different. But they'll have an achiness. But they have back pain. So then you got to sort it out. Okay, where's the pain, upper, lower? So keep in mind, most people think, God, if you have this big curve, it has to hurt a lot. That's not the case. So back pain, if they have it in the thoracic region, double check, do they have kyphosis? Because people with kyphosis do have achiness or back pain in the center of the thoracic spine, okay? So that gives you a thought, oh, I better check that again. If they have in the lumbar region, here is part of your differential, spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis, and mechanical or muscle. If we really have quite a bit of pain, my goodness, we need to rule out intraspinal lesions and infection. If this is an acute pain, I mean really acute, that this kid is looking sick, that it's on and off, say it's a six-year-old, Michelle, <laughs> Six-year-old, four-year-old. Four-year-olds usually don't complain of back pain. Four-year-olds complain of stomach aches, right? Jackie, don't they? I mean, if they don't want to do something, I remember me. I didn't want to go to school one day. I complained of stomach aches, but that's me. You know, people aren't like me. But back pain, and they really are sick, or they, you tell them to bend over, and they're like, I mean, acutely, that's a red flag. That's not scoliosis. We got a problem we need to act on pretty quick. Okay, our treatment is based off of curve magnitude. How big is the curve and how much growth? There, this is a huge one, so keep this one in mind. How much growth? So if we have a two-year-old, do we have a lot of growth? Oh, yeah, big time. But if I have an 18-year-old, no. Okay? Here's the takeaway. The larger the curve, the more growth potential, the higher chance of curve progression. So the younger they are, the bigger the curve, harder it's going to be for all of us. So the greatest risk of progression is during the rapid growth spurt with our adolescents, and also if they're really, really, really small. So what helps us is looking at females or menstrual cycles. I ask all patients, I get to, you know, you're, you're taking your history, you know, why you're here, blah, blah, blah. Any problems with your back? No. Anybody in the family with scoliosis? No. And then I'll do my exam, and then I'll say, by chance, when was your very first menstrual cycle? Have you started your periods? And they think, what does that have to do with scoliosis? 
Rapid growth spurt occurs right before the menstrual cycle. Once they start their menstrual cycles, they have two years of growth left. So this is a nice kind of easy formula. Two years of growth, but at a much lower rate, much slower rate. So the most important part is before they start that menstrual cycle. Guys tend to be two years behind, so we've got to follow them a little uh, longer. So our treatment, mild curves. Remember scoliosis, they should have no curve, zero, zero. So curves that are 10 to 25 degrees, and that's if you took uh, plane geometry, physics, right? This is zero, this is 90. So if we're talking about 10 degrees up to 25 degrees, we want to watch them. This is called a mild curve. And we want to see them every four to six months until they stop growing. So when kids are referred, the, pedi the pediatric nurse practitioners, primary care, if you are referred a child for scoliosis from school screening, do not see them just once. You need to reassure those parents. You need to see them back about every four to six months because we have to see what happens, if this curve is going to get worse or not. And we can't stress that enough. Parents don't hear that enough until they're done growing. In this day and age, people like a pill, people like to do something. They don't want to wait to see if something's going to happen. They want to most of the time be actively involved. But we find exercise alone does not do anything for the curve. It doesn't make it go away, it doesn't make it better, but we feel exercise is good for everybody. So if I have a parent that's really pushing for physical therapy or exercise, I say, great, mom, you can do it with them. Wouldn't that be great? You can do it as a team. So there's our push for everyone to be physically active with parents. But exercise alone is not. As we say, it's probably a genetic component inside. We just have to see how it's going to produce as time goes on. Bracing. Bracing we do when we have moderate recurves, 25 to 45 degrees, while the child's still growing. So the whole purpose of it is to prevent that curve from getting worse if the child is still growing. So if I have an eight-year-old that has a 30-degree curve, we have a lot of growth potential, right? It has not started the periods, so we're going to brace that child. If we have a 17-year-old that is three years status post monarchy, are we going to brace? Nah, we're going to watch them. The brace does not make that curve go away. There's the hard part. So whatever curve we get, we're hoping to stop that curve at that point. And we find if we're able to stop it, at 30 degrees, we do pretty good. It's 70% effective. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's not 100%. So the two type of braces we used, the TLSO, when you see this, a bracing, the letters apply to what part of the body is being held. So if you have a TLSO, it's thoracic lumbar sacral orthosis, which means brace. Here's a nice time bending brace. This is where, what we use the majority of the time. This you wear 22 out of 24 hours. This you wear 8 to 10 hours at night. Which one would you like to have? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Neither one. <laughs> at night, we have a higher compliance, we think. We think. We are, there's studies out there night now that have heat sensors. Heat sensors. Did anyone take piano lessons here? I had to keep my log. Did you keep your log? How many hours a day did you practice? At the end of the week, I fill it up. I practiced four the day before, but each day I practice, right? Kids the same way. Who knows? But now we have the heat sensors with research going on, so we actually know what, how much they're wearing without them knowing. So interesting. But we find a higher compliance because they don't have to worry about their kids or uh, their friends. They have no restrictions of activity. No restrictions of activity. They continue with all activities. We want them to be active. So curve progress. If we have a large curve greater than 45 degrees. We recommend it when no other treatment can prevent the curve from getting worse. Understand if you have a child who is, I'm going to pick an age, three years of age with a 60 degree curve, we hope not to do a spinal fusion. Because whenever we do a spinal fusion, fusion is underlined, the bones do not grow anymore. So knowing that five-year-old has a lot of growth, we want them to continue to grow, so we don't want to fuse them. So we have a big challenge here. But for our teenagers, we can do this. So the purpose is to stop that curve from getting worse. We want to make it straighter instead of straight. 
we tell them whatever the body will allow, that's what we will get back. We still want them to be able to walk out of the hospital. Safety is the first concern. We also want to balance them. Sometimes they're off balance. So we can take a curve like this, put different combinations of usually screws and rods. We don't usually fuse the entire spine unless we have a neuromuscular curve. Then we go as high as possible and as low as possible. Because wherever you don't fuse kids with neuromuscular problems, they will continue to progress. So what if our child was really young? This is when we have our early onset scoliosis program or the growing spine program, and we use casting because we find kids, the very little kids, don't do well with braces. They don't hold the curves well enough. We're not quite sure if it's because the parents have too much sympathy and don't put the brace on, the kids aren't wearing the brace, or it just doesn't hold the curve well enough, but we find it doesn't work. So the very young kids, we find casting does work. And you think, oh, that poor kid. I'm amazed how well these kids do in these casts. It becomes a part of them. And it's nice, there's no debate with the child. It's on. Yes, they can well wash the skin underneath it with rubbing alcohol so they stay nice and clean. They can still wash their hair and things like that. Kid doesn't know any different. They do quite well. Problem is, we got a big curve we got to deal with. And I'm more concerned about their heart and lungs if we don't deal with that curve. So, if by chance our curve continues to progress, we have what we call a growing rod program that we take a curve like this, we put pedicle screws at the bottom and at the top, and this is the only place we put fusion, and the only place to put fusion there, and in between, this is free, and then nowadays, we these are magnetic, that we put a magnetic device on their back every three months, and it drives the spine. You can see our connection here. This is 14 millimeters. We've expanded it compared to no expansion here. Pretty awesome, huh? So now that we've been doing that, because we want to get the spine, we want to drive the spine as this child is growing to allow room for that heart and lungs to continue to develop in that chest. Once we get to a certain time, we're able to fuse them and be done with their curves. So we have traditional growing rods that we go in about every eight months and lengthen them as an outpatient surgery. Then we have our magnetic ones that we put these in and we do it as an outpatient every three months. Ineffective treatments or no evidence of effectiveness. Physical therapy for scoliosis doesn't do it. For kyphosis, it does help and it can improve and it does really well. So we do use therapy for that, and if we have mechanical back pain or muscular back pain, it does help. It's the number one choice we use. Manipulation does not help scoliosis. Electrical stimulation does not help, nor does chiropractic treatment. Here's an example of a nine-year-old. They'll come in saying, I have a swollen back. Many times they don't know what this is. They were in the summertime. They put on the bathing suit. They bend over and, oh, oh my God. Or they blame it on a fight at school. It must have happened because someone punched them in school or they fell down. But they also have the shoulder problem, too, because look at one's higher than the other one. So pre menarchal this person, it will say, has a positive family history of scoliosis of the grandmother, and the review system is negative. If you're going to see this patient, you want to get x-rays, you're going to get a PA and lateral standing of the entire spine. It comes back to your office. And in your office, you only have the size of a chest x-ray. Is there a problem here? No, looks pretty good, looks pretty straight. But the problem is we didn't get a large cassette. We cut off where the curve is. And there's a lot of centers that do not have the large cassette or have the capability of having the full length. That's why we caution if you can get it. Does your facility, are they able to do that? If they are, then go ahead and get x-rays. If they aren't, then we recommend you refer them to us and we will get the proper x-ray. That last one, say by chance you got that film at the bottom. The radiologist measures it or they measure this curve and they measured it that was 30 degrees. Now, we measure it, we do our own measurements. Radiologists, believe it or not, they really have a hard time measuring our scoliosis curves. It is what it is. But how we measure it is we take a, a line and we draw it at the top of the vertebrae that's most tilted and the bottom of the vertebrae that's most tilted, draw perpendicular lines, and we measure them. 
You took physics, you took clay geometry, angles. That's why I think we took that course. I don't know. It's the only thing I got out of it, but I know my angles, okay? But the problem is, say this radiologist measured this one, and they report back to your office three degrees. So you talk to the mom, you say, oh, yeah, I took that. Yeah. Okay, so they're going to recommend probably bracing per se. But let me have you go see this, these people who treat it. And they come to us and we measure it, and now we really have an 89-degree curve. It was not a 30-degree curve. It was measured incorrectly. This happens more times than I like to tell you about. So be careful of measurements or having a radiologist give you a report, say we'd just like to refer you, and it opens a window because otherwise they think we're surgery happy. So accurate measurements are very, very important. So we like to repeat, avoid repeating films because the technical areas, incorrect positioning, poor technique, and the cassette was not large enough. We also like to get to know the families. If you have a small curve, we don't mind small curves. We want them to come to us because we have time to get to know them because if that curve gets bigger, we've established a relationship, they trust us, they go with the recommendations that we can give them, okay? So why don't we always get an MRI? You know, parents really love MRI. They think that's the try and true what you need to get. Everyone gets an MRI. I know in your office, but in our office, we have a hard time getting MRIs approved with, with insurance companies these days. It is horrible. But, so it's not our first line. Always x-rays are. So if they have neurological signs of deficits, if we have a left thoracic curve, that gives us a ding, ding, ding of a warning sign, okay? The most common is a right thoracic curve. Kids with little kids, my one-year-old, my two-year-old, three-year-olds, my congenital, they all get MRIs. We want to know if there's anything going on inside that spine causing it. If we have a rapid curve progression, I mean, I have a child that was at 45 degrees and four months later went up to 90 degrees. It's like, whoa. We want to make sure there's nothing inside that spinal cord that's causing it. Um, pain not relieved by rest and NSAIDs. When we're talking about muscular back pain, our first line of course is we put them on anti-inflammatories, then physical therapy for two months, then if they're not better, then we do the MRI. And we'll go over that again in a minute. So low back pain, I'm going to switch off of scoliosis and talk about spondylolysis. Spondylolysis. Okay. So it's in the low back area more commonly. And it's a defect in the bony ring of the spinal column, in the pars articularis. If you look at a lateral film, they talk about the Scotty dog sign. If you ever have one, have the radius pointed out. Or if we ever have one, I'll point it out to you guys. It's kind of cool. It's like the collar of the dog, the Scotty dog. You can see that's where, where it has spondylolysis. Okay, it's a stress fracture. It's with sports, we have the kids that are in sports with a lot of repetitive, <laughs> repetitive, Repetitive, repetitive. That's it. Attack it. Repetitive. So your gymnasts, your your pitchers, your twisting, those are the ones that hyperextending. It's really tough on the low back. So this is your little stress fracture. They come in. I have more kids that go back and say, "I have a broken back," and you think, "I have to stop for a minute." Oh, okay. They got spondylolysis. So how do we treat that spondylolysis? We want to slow them down. We want that area to heal. So we're going to take them out of that sport for a while because otherwise they risk having both sides of the pars articularis fracturing. And then you can lead to spondylolisthesis. And it spells exactly how you pronounce it. Spondylolisthesis is a slipping of one vertebrae forward onto the other one. And you can see this pretty well on x-ray. If you go, you can see this much better than you can your spondylolisthesis. But we grade this of how much it's slipping forward. If it's this much, if it's a quarter amount, it's grade one. If it's half the amount, it's grade two. If it's three, four. And sometimes it literally slips off. Ooh, that's bad. That's bad. And the problem is inside this area is your spinal cord in these holes. And coming out of those holes are your nerve roots. So as that's slipping forward, it's putting pressure on your nerve roots. And that's what's causing your pain, usually down your legs. Okay? We don't want that. But, so if you have a person with a low back, all centralized here, you did your exam, you did your forward bending, they're like, oh my gosh, 
Those are classics when you hyperextend them back. Ow, they hurt. Okay, send them off. We saw no scoliosis, so we get an AP lateral oblique of the LS, lumbar sacral spine, to rule out spondylolisthesis or spondylolysis. Then you could refer them, or from the start you can refer them, but you can rule that out if you'd like. Backpack guideline, 15% of the body weight is what they should be carrying that backpack. Convince the schools of it. Convince the kids of it. Because the kids haven't forbid they don't go to their lockers anymore. They don't even have to carry some of those books home, but they do, so it's both sides. But that's the general rule we say. It should be 15%. I think it's helpful that we're having the internet. More books are going on the internet, so we're getting less books. Hopefully with time that'll help that. They should have the straps on both shoulders. I don't know how cool it is. You should on one shoulder, right? Not cool. And don't even go there with rolling backpacks. Don't even go there. We want to spread the weight. We want to promote the good posture. And the position of the backpack should be right smack in the middle, two inches above the weight, if, you're going to, if they ever want to discuss that with you. So when we have a person, we've ruled out. They don't have scoliosis, they don't have spondylolysis, they don't have spondylolisthesis, neurological exam is normal, they don't have any radiating pain going down their legs, because remember those nerve roots go down, so when someone says, oh, I'm fine, except I this butt, it's really getting me. Sciatica could be that nerve root being pinched, you don't have those things, and even if you do have those things, we're going to first of all put them on some anti-inflammatory. Whether it's Advil, Motrin, Naproxen, Naproxen, settle down the inflammation, settle down the pain, twice a day get a blood level, send them to physical therapy for two months. Minimum is two months. After two months, if they're better, great. You don't have to come back. If you're not better, come on back, and that's when we will possibly or probably order MRI. If we try to order this MRI before these, your insurance company will not approve it. I can guarantee it. If the MRI is negative, which most of the time it is, which I'm glad, they're back to physical therapy. Because most back pain, we all have it, and you can apply this to yourself as adults. If you have back pain, here's your course. Naproxen twice a day. Now, when you prescribe someone on Advil or Naproxen and Naproxen or Advil or Motrin, you have to say to them, I'm putting on Naproxen, but you cannot take Advil, ibuprofen, Motrin, you want to get them off the other anti-inflammatories. They need to take it with food so you don't have your GI upset, okay? So always it's kind of part of that spiel you give to protect. Resources. We have the Scoliosis Research Society, which is the uh, number one world um, group uh, experts for scoliosis. Their website has, the website, the website has terrific patient education information on it. American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, National Scoliosis Foundation, the Scoliosis Association, or support groups. And then I put my number, and I made a bad mistake that I did not give you our other numbers. So I want to give you our appointment line, because whether it's pediatric adult, we have one phone number. Woohoo! And that's 216. 844-7200. We have, in, in pediatric orthopedics at Rainbow, we have a very strong, very experienced, very wonderful group of physicians and nurses and nurse practitioners. And two of them are here, Emily Canicia and Michelle Calabretta. We also have Michelle Janis, and we also have Michelle Moran. Very strong team, and we all specialize. We all have our different specialties. We work as a team with our physicians. So you can always pull us up on email and send an email. I have somebody that, who should they go to? And we will be more than happy to help refer you or get your patient into the clinics. We see it at least eight different locations. We go all the way out to Sandusky. We all go all the way down to Medina and to Twinsburg. So we are all around. Be more than happy to take care of your patients. So what questions can I answer for you now? Yes. Uh, so for the neuromuscular kids that have like some role in what's going on there is often ask us even so when they're in their non field for you, like what the benefits are of like, 
Very good question. Yeah, bracing for neuromuscular kids, especially like um, your cerebral palsy and myeloid dysplasia, it hopefully will slow down the curve from progressing. We know it's not going to cure it. Um, it will help them with balance. Some folks balance is sitting up in the wheelchair because we want them to be remain sitters. If they're standers, we want to remain standing. If they're sitters, we want them to remain sitting. We don't want to have them be in bed rest. So we're just trying to see if we can slow down this curve to get them to a proper age where we confuse them. Otherwise, we are left with having to do growing rods, which is repetitive surgery for higher risk. So we feel it's beneficial in that way. Some physicians won't prescribe, so you do have different opinions, and it depends on the parents. We kind of take cues on that too, okay? If we have a child with muscular dystrophy, as soon as they have an ounce of a curve, say if they have 20 degrees and they're in a wheelchair, they're into surgery. They are fused immediately because their pulmonary function at that time is the best it ever will be because we know it's only going to be worse next week, next year. And we already know as soon as they have a curve, it's only going to get worse. So we will do them very rapidly instead of waiting for that curve to get worse. So we would not even brace them. We would go ahead with surgery. Yeah, especially muscular dystrophy. Yes. And mild dysplasia, it's always a bag of worm, right? I can tell you about 100% complication with mild dysplasia. So you try to delay them to try and get them as healthy as possible, and then we take them on. And some of it is timing to get to know that family. Right? Okay. Good questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do you explain to the kids and their family the purpose of physical therapy for that action? What is the point? Stretching and strengthening of the back and abdominal strengthening. Now, I don't even go about the abdominal strengthening because they're all going to tell you, she's so active. She's in all sorts of sports. Her abdominals are so tight. I know. You know in that sport? That's great she's doing that, but they don't isolate where we want them. So we'd really like them to really focus on this, and what we really want them to do is teach them proper exercises for the back. I don't want the heat. I don't want the ice. I don't want the manipulation. I want active, active, active stretching and strengthening of the back and also the hamstrings. Oh, my God, are kids' hamstrings these days so friggin' tight. They're not exercising. You know, I'm old, I was out there sled riding, playing kick the can, you know what I mean, doing all this stuff. Nowadays, these computers, the kids aren't out there not. And I really believe that's why we have our increased back pain, because the kids aren't out there running around and playing all day and all night. So stretching and strengthening of that area. And that's why I say, oh, I know. And we want them to stay active, but let's isolate. Let's give it a chance. Usually it works, too. And we say to them, if you don't do the exercise, you're going to have the back pain. But if you do the exercises, it's going to help. And when they come back and go, yeah, okay, you know what to do now. We've tried to set them up for the rest of their life. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. Good question. Other people. Oh, by the way, it isn't 30 years. I'm at 38 years, but that's okay. <laughs> but wait, but wait. I'm not that old. They hired me when I was born. <laughs> they saw the potential and they said, that girl, sign her up. And my parents did. They bought into it. So, you know, I'm a rainbow brat. It's good. It's all good. All right. Thanks so much. Oh, one other thing. I'm sorry. I have to do a housekeeping. Under my objective, my last objective there, something happening in the translation. This is not correct. I would, if you didn't all say, no, it would be wrong. So it's supposed to be discuss current treatment options for muscular or mechanical back pain, including da da da. That was so you could get your pharmacological credit. Okay, so all right. So put those words in there, and then I can say hopefully we met our objectives. Oh, my thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.